Hello and welcome to the Hills Road Guest Speaker Podcast. Today we are pleased to present Sunday Times and international best-selling author and former Guardian journalist, Sarah Vaughan. So please sit back and enjoy this talk brought to you by the Hills Road Sixth Form College Guest Speaker Program. It's really lovely to be here as a parent of a child who started in 2021. I've never actually been on the site before, so it's really exciting to to be here. Um, When Ian suggested that I came and talked to you about my career path, I really wasn't sure I had anything sufficiently interesting to say. I wasn't being falsely modest. It still seems genuinely like a complete fluke that I've had one career as a journalist and a second as a best-selling author with a global number one Netflix series. Um, It just sounds ridiculous saying it because nobody's more surprised about that than me. Um, But then I realised that when I was at school, does that sound all right? When I was at school, it would have been absolutely inconceivable to imagine working in these worlds. I didn't know anyone who was a journalist, I didn't know any authors, and I certainly didn't know anyone who worked in TV. So I'd have been intrigued if someone could have told me a bit about those fields and about the challenges and the pitfalls and the knockbacks um, they'd experienced on the way. Um, At the risk of sounding like a sort of Instagram cliche, I'm going to tell you a bit about my journey and uh, try and give you a little bit of advice, uh, discuss my failures, and hopefully uh, talk about the highs a little bit too. Um, So people often ask if I wrote as a child... I did, and I was Devon Young Writer of the Year at the age of 10 in 1983. I think it was a slightly made-up Um, award by a a local bookshop but my mystery about some standing stones in the far west of Cornwall won me £75 in cash which is quite a lot in 1983. I bought a Roberts radio and a typewriter, this was pre-computers. A trip to the publishers Hodder and Stoughton which we never actually took because I lived in Devon and they weren't paying expenses and so it was just completely unfeasible to do that. Um, and £50 in book vouchers. And in those days, you could buy a book for a pound. So I bought as many Judy Blooms as I could get away with. (laughs) And then my mum made me buy a leather-bound set of Jane Austens, which, you know, clearly I didn't want to buy at all. I was quite an academic child, and I can vividly remember mourning the sense of losing my imagination um, as I saw it, as I became preoccupied with usual teenage things. So my parents splitting up, I was really badly bullied through both schools and with GCSEs. And I stopped writing stories completely, but I did read voraciously, not just my mum would give me Jane Eyre when I was nine, which clearly I didn't understand a lot of apart from the fact that I had awful, awful nightmares about, you know, the mad woman in the attic. And in fact, the mad woman in the attic is in Little Disasters, so everything's copy, everything gets used. Um, And I also read lots of, I read those Austins, I read D.H. Lawrence, I read lots of Hardy, Du Maurier, then Ruth Rendell, Barbara Vine, and obviously Agatha Christie, because that's what you sort of do at 13. In those days, there weren't sort of young adult novels in the ways that you know we have them now you kind of jump straight from well I wasn't allowed to read Ina Blyton because she wrote too badly and was racist but um, (laughs) I kind of jumped straight from um, I don't know Roald Dahl I guess to D.H. Lawrence which is quite quite an extreme jump Um, despite this the idea of that I could be a, a writer wasn't something that ever occurred to me engineering, teaching, nursing, those were all the sort of pathways that were understood at my, frankly, not very academic school and completely rubbish career service. Um, An arts degree in music, which is what I originally applied for, or English, was seen as really pretty useless. And when I mentioned at the age of 17 that I wanted to be a journalist, the idea was emphatically shut down. The careers teacher had briefly worked on local papers and she told me that I wasn't tough enough to doorstep families about bereavements. To which I'd say to any journalist who's in, to any student who's interested in journalism, A, not all journalism requires you to do that now at all. And B, never let anyone underestimate your ability you don't know what you're going to be capable of in certain situations. And you certainly shouldn't be limited at 17. And I'd also add that, and there aren't that, there are lots of students here actually, I'd also add that you guys have 
it's shown such resilience and skill at independent learning during the COVID years. You develop such empathy and you're so much more attuned to the need for emotional intelligence and awareness of people's mental health than our generation ever were. So you'd be absolutely more than capable of dealing with this. I was really frightened of that teacher, but I also knew that deep down she shouldn't define me. As the Julia Roberts character says in Pretty Woman, which isn't a, novel, a film I'd normally quote because it really hasn't stood the test of time. Big mistake. Big mistake. Huge. <laughs> I didn't put a meme up because I thought that would be too embarrassing, but it's a really good meme. Um, I ignore the careers teacher and the headmaster of the local boys school which I had to apply through who told me that to get into Oxford I'd have to apply to a women's college and rely on my flute playing and my charm. I hope that's not something anyone would say these days. Again I'm not quite sure why I ignored him. I didn't have an overweening sense of confidence. I was after all the kid who'd at 13 gone to secondary school with bunches and kicker boots reading Jane Austen. I might as well have had, you know, loser tattooed across my forehead. I just knew that viscerally I didn't want to be in an, old fe in an all female environment, which I don't think actually exists anymore. And that I didn't want to be told, you know, how I was going to apply. So my top advice from school is to follow your gut and not to let anyone diminish you or close down opportunities. I mean, obviously, within reason. I mean, I gave up chemistry at 14, so I couldn't have said I wanted to be a doctor or something. But, you know, just... I'm sure that doesn't happen here. But don't let anybody tell you you can't apply to do something. And as an aside, if anyone's applying for to do Oxbridge entrance... Don't do what I did, which is to get the day of your exam wrong and then have to hurtle into an exam already in process. Uh, if that happens, <laughs> uh, get your, bullet, your essays down in bullet points if you run out of time. Don't panic in an interview. If an interviewer tells you mid-interview, should we stop pretending you know what you're doing? Because that happened to me as well. <laughs> Uh, somehow I agreed that we should just stop pretending that and move on to the next question. Um, and despite this, when that happened at Oxford with me, um, remember they're looking for potential, they're not looking for the finished product. And also remember, and this is a good lesson for all future rejections, because we all have lots of them, and as I talk through the process, you will hear about lots of rejections. If you don't get in, it's not a reflection of your worth as an individual. It really isn't. On that particular day... It didn't go as you wanted. But there will be other opportunities. And I really genuinely believe that if you work hard, things work out in the end. I hope that my process shows that. I was lucky, though. I did go to Oxford. And one of the best things I did, did was to get into student journalism. By my third year, I was features editor on Charwell, the student newspaper. And I hadn't really realised it was a bit of a golden ticket when it came to applying for work experience on national broadsheets, because at that time, so many editors had started off there as well. I realised pretty quickly that I wanted to try and do this as a job. And so from the summer holidays after my first year, I interspersed temp work uh, with work experience. In those days, there was no expectation that you did your work experience before you'd done, done your UCAS um, application. So I did work experience at BBC Radio Devon, which was my local station, at Fox FM, which was the independent radio station in Oxford. Um, I did weeks at The Guardian and The Observer, and once I graduated at The Times. It still didn't occur to me that I could be an author. Um, the Oxford English degree is really traditional. You don't have to read anything after 1832. And as far as I was concerned, novels were very much the preserve of dead white men. The most modern writers I ever studied were um, Virginia Woolf for my paper on the novel and T.S. Eliot for my poetry dissertation. So, you know, I was kind of, what was that now, about, 80, about 100 years out, not 100 years out of date then, but now I am. Psychological thrillers, as we thought of them, just weren't really a thing. So, I mean, there was there were with Barbara Vine and Ruth Rendell, but the girl on the train hadn't happened, Gone Girl happened, hadn't happened. And I can still remember being really shocked in 1997 when Zadie Smith got a book deal just after leaving Cambridge at the age of 21. It didn't occur to me that anyone could possibly have anything to say at that age. But I did think I could work as a journalist. And I think I assumed after graduating that I'd get a job as a trainee journalist quite easily because I had all this work experience. To quote that Julia Roberts uh, character again, big mistake. Um, in those days, the Media Guardian advertised jobs on a Monday. And to my parents' dismay, I applied for 50 jobs before I got one interview. And that was for a job in the local press. In those days, a good way of getting into journalism was to train on a local paper, but in 94 to 5, newsprint has suddenly become far more expensive and um, papers were cutting massively back on their trainees and it's 
I found some statistic about, you know, the number of, tra- of local papers that have closed since the pandemic. And, you know, it's just exponential. When I did get an interview with the Bucks Free Press in High Wycombe, I discovered I wasn't very good at lying. So another tip is that if someone says to you, You've been at Oxford for, two, for you've been at Oxford. You'll be with us for two years, and then you'll go to Fleet Street. Don't agree. <laughs> just 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 argue that even if that happens, you're just going to work so hard. They're going to really want you there. Um, I looked embarrassed and mumbled something that suggested I agreed. The Yeovil Express interview didn't go any better. Nor did the final ro- uh, round interview for the BBC's graduate trainee scheme. We had to read the news, including an item about the Thai uh, Thai island of Phuket which I obviously couldn't pronounce. <laughs> it was like that sort of faulty towers clip about don't mention the war, don't mention the war, don't say it, don't say it. Oh, I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure the real reason I didn't get it was either because I was intimidated by the other ca- candidates who claimed to have so much more experience than me. I mean, they all claimed that they were kind of, you know, basically running Five Live. Or because I was applying to BBC London, an area I didn't know at all, but my boyfriend was living there at the time. Another mistake, I'd have done so much better if I'd applied to the area in which I was working, wiping tables at that time and working as a kitchen porter and where I'd been brought up, that was Devon. Um, And I also should have remembered that everyone's busking it, everyone's an imposter, there's an awful lot of chat and it doesn't actually mean they're any better than you. Remember that for university interviews as well when you see, well actually it's not the same actually for these guys because it's all on Zoom isn't it, but in those days when you see very sort of overconfident people. Finally, I was offered a job as a reporter on Pensions World, based in Croydon. I didn't want to go into financial journalism. I was pretty financially illiterate. I'm not even sure I knew what a pension was in those days. But I was fed up with wiping tables and working in warehouses, and it was that crucial first step. The editor was lovely. She was so lovely that I confessed I'd just been offered three weeks' work experience with expenses paid on the Times, and I wondered if I could join after this. I really wasn't very good at interviews. Um, But I'll always remember her generosity. She said, take the work experience, don't come and work here, go and do that instead. Um, And I don't think it was just because she knew that I clearly didn't have my heart in it. I think she saw that that was an opportunity. So actually another piece of advice is that if you can, try and seize some of these opportunities. I still regret, it sounds silly, that I didn't do the three weeks work experience on Vogue because they they wouldn't pay for travel expenses or living expenses or and I lived in Devon and I couldn't possibly afford to do that but you know who knows might have been might have been editor of Vogue by now um Anyway, it was the right call. Three weeks turned into three months during which I started to write for money. At first, it was just being paid by the word for the shopping column. So you had to say, like, how much things were in Asda. It doesn't sound very like a Times thing, but it really was what you did. And a certain George Osborne had done it a couple of years before. Um, But then I wrote a piece for the arts page, and then I wrote one with a picture byline about gender differences in degree results. I was so desperate to be published that I agreed to write a first-person piece headed why I didn't get a first from Oxford. It was momentarily embarrassing and there were some rather nasty comments from other slightly jealous people on the paper, but at least it got me noticed. The interviews for the Times trainee scheme came up, but despite, that is another failure, despite the managing director and the education editor backing me in an hour and a half long interview with the editor during which I had to discuss how I'd revamp the paper to attract younger readers, the editor was insufficiently impressed. The traineeship went to a contemporary from Oxford. He was very bright. He still writes for a broadsheet paper, although he has to write about Brexit a lot. Um, But he'd also been educated at a top public school, and he later told me that during their 20-minute interview, they just talked about cricket. Still, as Nora Ephron said, everything is copy, and that will be relevant for later. I have to admit that at that point, a whole year after graduating, I felt rather bleak. And I felt hugely embarrassed as well. I'd had several rejections by now from local papers, from the BBC, from the Times, and one from the Mirror traineeship too, where I made the mistake of saying I'd rather work for the Independent, which the Mirror Group also owns. That's another tip. Always read read the publication you're applying for and really suggest that that's the only publication you really want to work for. Um, But I truly believe that things... This sounds very trite, but I truly believe that things do happen for a reason because actually I was in a better position in the end. Because I then went off and I did a five-month journalism course set up largely for regional journalists um, at something called the Westminster Press in Hastings. 
Um, there I learned about media law, and for two and a half hours every morning, we were taught Pittman shorthand. I left with a very, you had to get 100 words per minute to pass, and I left with 110 words per minute, which is quite hard to get those extra 10. Um, and while I was on the course, I was contacted by the managing editor of PA, which is a news organization, a news agency, a bit like Reuters or AP. And the managing editor at the Times, the one who'd wanted me to get that traineeship, had recommended me. They told me I didn't even need to come for an interview, that his word was enough, and they wanted to offer me a trainee post. So 18 months after graduating, in January 1996, I started at the PA offices in central London. It was a huge baptism of fire, and it was exactly what I needed. The shifts were really long and grueling. Some would start at 7 a.m. in the morning. Others went from 2 until midnight. The pay was really rubbish, although it was better than the £2.90 an hour I got wiping tables. Um, the employment conditions would breach all HR rules. I recently got a DM on Twitter from someone who to say that she remembered the deputy editor screaming and swearing at me across the newsroom. He'd been the deputy editor of The Sun, and she remembered his full, his full letter words that he was screaming at me across the newsroom, and I have completely blanked it. It was either happened so regularly that I just blanked it. I'd made a mistake about... Th- I tried to do a drop intro. I made a mistake about the number of people on the football team. And he would, went absolutely ballistic. Um, but yeah, so there were, it was all the things that you, you would hope that you would never experience in a modern work environment kind of went on there. But the shift system meant that five, within five weeks, I was covering the old witch bus bomb. So back in 1996, it was the IRA who were the terrorists we were worried about. And that was kind of a a terrorist attack that happened there. Um, I learned things like I quickly realised I didn't want to be a tabloid journalist because I hated doorstepping. So I had to wait, this really shows my age, um, outside the Harbour Club when Diana, Princess of Wales, was thought to be having an affair with Will Carling, just in case she turned out, or when Richard Branson had kept trying to go around the world in a hot air balloon. I had to wait for 12 hours in the snow outside his Notting Hill house in case his wife would speak to me. Uh, I realised I really didn't want to do that sort of job. I spent six months as a parliamentary correspondent in the House of Lords, which is, again was relevant for anatomy. I spent six months in features, weeks in the law courts, and because I had that excellent shorthand, a year after joining, I was the only journalist at the opening of an inquest into the death of Stephen Lawrence. He was a black teenager who was, I'm sure everyone knows, who was... Um, thought, well, he was killed by a white gang, or members of two, two members have been convicted now. But at this point, they couldn't bring a prosecution. But there was an inherent drama in the inquest because um, Michael Mansfield QC kept asking this gang, who were literally standing there, and I was literally in the press box here, he kept asking them to, to, to talk about the events of that night, and to every single question they said no comment. And their, their wall of silence created its own drama. I filed that within half an hour. Within half an hour, all of Fleet Street was there. The mail splashed on it. It kind of then took it up as a campaign. And the experience was absolutely critical to teaching me about the drama inherent in a courtroom, something that helped inspire Anatomy of a Scandal. And then I had a stroke of luck. In August 1997, the Guardian sent their trainee to PA to learn about doorstepping and the need for stamina. And in return, I was offered a month on the paper. No news ever seemed to happen in August, not least because all politicians, including the new PM, Tony Blair, were on holiday and all the press too. But at the very end of August 1997, on my last day on that bank holiday weekend, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a car crash in Paris. And the Guardian star reporter, Kamal Ahmed, was on a yacht off Oban. Luke Harding was at a wedding in Derbyshire. I was very hungover in London because I'd been clubbing with my younger sister, who was then a student, and I was trying to impress her. But it's amazing what adrenaline can do. At 5 p.m., I hadn't written a word of the 2,000-word piece I was meant to write about Di and Dodie's relationship, and the desk were getting quite frantic. I went, there's another top tip, I went and talked to myself in the mirror in the loose and just basically told me I had myself I had to do it. By 6.30, they had the words. By 7.30, we were in the pub and I was being the promise of the next job that came up. I joined them in December and had a staff job by the time I was 25. And I learned so much from The Guardian. Looking back, I've had so many experiences that have fed into my work as an author or taught me how to research and interview people. I went to Belfast to cover the Northern Ireland Correspondents' Leave, again, at a supposedly quiet time. And I found myself having a crash course in Northern Ireland politics having when I had to co- cover the Holy Cross riots in the Ardoyan re- area of, of Belfast. I covered the Paddington Rail crash at which 31 people died, a really sobering experience, not least because I was told to get colour, and I ducked beneath a police cordon to do so. Bit of advice, don't ever duck beneath a police cordon. More glamorously, I interviewed Leonardo DiCaprio, and I caused him to run away. (laughs) 
Pat, my, my son says that's my best flex. <laughs> um, I, I, I make a joke about the fact I was 30 by that time, so I was five years over his limit, but that's probably not why. Um, I covered more court cases. Um, DJ Jonathan King, who was accused of sexually assaulting boys um, in children's homes before Jimmy Savile was accu being accused of such things. I developed an unfortunate niche as covering child murders because I was seen as non-threatening and empathetic and because my shorthand was so fast. So I covered the disappearance of a little girl called Sarah Payne in West Sussex and the subsequent trial of the paedophile Roy Whiting. My introduction to Norfolk was the murder of a 12-year-old called Thomas Haysborough who was strangled by a paedophile there. I covered the trial of a woman called Angela Cannings who was accused of murdering her babies, a conviction later overthrown because of questionable statistics by Professor Sir Roy Meadows. Uh, my introduction to Cambridgeshire was um, covering the SOA murders. Like so many other reporters who worked on SOA, it was a story that affected me more than any other, not least because for 11 days we were in such cl close proximity in this village where, quite understandably, people didn't want us there, and because we were in such close proximity to Ian Huntley, the school caretaker who murdered them. Soham taught me that I couldn't write any more about violence against women and girls. Ironic that, that I then go on to write a novel about consent. It was a really intense period, and I realised at his arraignment at Peterborough Crown Court, that's where the first court hearing where he turns up and he turned up and, and gave his plea, and people kind of threw eggs at the police van, that I just didn't want to go and do a background during Grimsby about the other girls he'd abused. Um, and that I couldn't sit through the details. Um, when the jury was sent out as I had for Roy Whiting's trial. I knew I wanted to have children at some point and I actually felt really viscerally that I couldn't have a baby. I couldn't I couldn't get pregnant in, in this sort of world. I'd already covered a colleague's maternity leave in the House of Commons and when she had her second baby, former Hill student, who, who uh, I think left here in 21, I secured the permanent job of political correspondent. It was the best thing that could have happened to me. I arrived in the lobby in March 2003 as MPs debated whether to go to war with Iraq. It was an energising period in which I learned how to decode what politicians and the likes of Alistair Campbell were and weren't saying, to understand what was meant by off the record or no comment or deep background. I witnessed big stories. I was with Tony Blair when the news broke that Dr. David Kelly, the government scientist at the heart of the allegations that the Iraq dossier had been sexed up, had killed himself. I saw the blood drain from the PM's face when he was asked if he had blood on his hands. I also observed cabinet ministers' resignations, which were actually much more rare in those days. <laughs> I know they kind of happen every week these days. Um, so Peter Mandelson, that was in my first stint over the Hinduja brothers' passports, and David Blunkett over a visa application for a nanny of his former lover. It actually seems really quaint reading those off that people were resigning over things like that now. <laughs> but, and critically, I interviewed Boris Johnson over the fact he'd lied about an affair with Petronella Wyatt, a story he disparaged as an inverted pyramid of piffle. Uh, the way it worked in the lobby was that you kind of were on call. There were four of us who did um, on calls in the Guardian team, and you kind of had a Sunday in turn. And I was on I was on call the day after Michael Howard had sacked him for lying about this. And I put in a call to him, you know, to, to try and follow up this story, not expecting him to call back, and he did. And amid all the sort of stuff that went on, he kind of, it's not a very good impression. He confirmed the story. And, it, and there was a real sort of um, all traps about blah, 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 because I was a he was he wrote columns for the Telegraph so the sort of expectation was you know we were all chaps in this together you know it was all just we all knew what the code was and it wasn't the fact and we didn't actually run a paper because we were the Guardian and we thought it was a bit mucky to write about people's affairs which was the wrong call because actually the story was the fact that he'd lied he thought it was okay to lie about it and in those days particularly lying lying in parliament was lying as a politician was something you just didn't do it wasn't the fact he'd had an affair but the fact he thought it was okay to lie about it and it's that entitlement that sense he could play by different rules that was absolutely fundamental to creating the character of james and anatomy of a scandal and then i had a baby who i'm not allowed to look at <laughs> sorry and i left the lobby um Ella's dad was a junior doctor doing really long antisocial hours and when I asked to work two thirds of the time because of childcare costs and practicalities and I actually wanted to see a bit of her um, and it was more efficient tax wise as well, I was told that wasn't possible in that job and so I became health correspondent uh, which was a job I wasn't very good at and I didn't enjoy at all. 
But things were to get worse. Because when I was pregnant with my second baby, um, I collapsed in the street with a pregnancy complication called SPD. I couldn't walk. I was in chronic pain. And when I tried to go back to the office, I failed. At 30 weeks, we moved up here for my husband's job. And then when Jack was 11 months old, I took voluntary redundancy. Frankly, I didn't, I think this is something that happens to a lot of women. I didn't earn enough to pay for a nanny in the commute and I couldn't walk. <laughs> I had an MRI scan and the consultant just said, you're going to be flat on your back in a week. You're ridiculous. But the money enabled me to bring up my baby and my toddler and to reassess. But career, career wise, it felt like a real low point. Um, I'd been on such a high in the lobby, you know, on a, on a, if you were on call on the Sunday, on the Monday morning, you might have the splash. And one day I had the entire front of the Guardian. I wish I kept it, you know, and I was so used to, since the age of 23, having my name on a paper or a news story and that sort of validating me. Um, I was also sort of in chronic pain and that kind of made me feel a bit of a failure as well. When Jack was two, I tried freelancing. And I, again, I found that the market had comp was really difficult. It completely changed. It was 2010 and the internet had arrived and nobody wanted to pay NUJ rates to someone with 13 years experience when they could get the copy for a lot cheaper or they could, you know, ask a blogger and they, or they could get it for free. And my confidence compounded by the pain and by something called maternal OCD, which I'd write about in my fourth novel, uh, but which I didn't, couldn't admit to it anyone at the time meant that you know I felt really at rock bottom career wise but sometimes and again I apologize if I sound like an Instagram cliche um, I think if things get really bad you turn them around because there's no other option so I really needed to earn some money and I had to have a new plan and I did and while I'd been at home with Jack I'd had time to think creatively for the first time in years I think I'd had I'd had 13 years of being a news reporter and just sort of seeing stories as sort of you know 400 500 600 words and thinking very very factually about everything but suddenly I was at home um one child had just started school I was at home with a toddler um and I started doing lots of sort of you know creative things with him and I started thinking about this story about motherhood and the impossibility of perfection and the different characters' voices started crowding my head. I'd been banging on about wanting to write, and a friend just told me to get on with it. Um, so I did. And on my 40th birthday, the same week that Jack started school, I announced I was going to write a novel and get it published within a year. It's clearly a completely ridiculous thing to say. I had no idea how to write a book. I'd never done a creative writing course. I'd never read a book about it. I hadn't heard of social media. I had no idea until I was published that aspiring writers could network there. But I did feel excited about this story. I had a sense it was it had a good hook. It was commercial. I needed to write something that would sell. There was no point me spending time creating something beautiful, that liter you know, literally perfect novel, not that exists, but, you know, some sort of exquisite book. I needed to write something that I could sell. Um, it was something that I thought I'd want to read, and it was something I felt I could say. My husband suggested I contact an agent, so I looked in the acknowledgements of a novel I'd enjoyed for a name. I emailed Lizzie Kramer. I told her I was a former journalist who'd written 30,000 words. I could work to a daily workout, and I knew where I was going. I didn't know that you're meant to finish and perfect your novel and really hone it before you contact anyone. Um, and I sent her my first three chapters, which, you know, was basically all I'd written, and it went on her slush pile, which is kind of where, you know, if you haven't asked for a book it just kind of goes there thankfully she did she employed somebody who read through all these things that came through and um i can remember exactly when she rang me up um i was actually looking um at the requirements to do a pgc at homerton <laughs> and i was on the website and i was thinking but i know i'd be a really awful teacher and it's you know i, I was thinking how can i afford to to because i would, would have been in english it wouldn't be a science how can i afford to pay to retrain to be a teacher and anyway she rang a bit like a fairy godmother and said you can really write uh she told me by this stage i'd written sixty-six thousand words so still not a whole book still only a first draft but she worked with me on it for the next eight months and 13 months after that birthday announcement we sold it in a two book preempt that's when a publishing house kind of tells you they'll pay you a certain amount of money so it doesn't go to auction and it was sold in nine countries 
So that first book, which was called The Art of Baking Blind, that should have been absolutely wonderful. Um, but despite the excitement, it, it didn't, I think the terminology is it didn't bother the bestseller lists. Um, the editor left before the first one was published as a paperback. And so I then had to write the second book of this deal with nobody in the publishing house to champion it. You know, I think there were lots of different maternity leaves and it kind of slipped through the, the net a little bit. Um, but my second novel did become a bestseller in France and has now sold almost a quarter of a million copies. Um, and that was enough to make me realise that actually I could write. It was just a question of how my words were marketed. It was a really interesting lesson in learning that actually there wasn't something intrinsically wrong with me, that I wasn't solely responsible for my book's success. It was down to other people as well. But it could have been the end of me as an author. My editor had left, my sales weren't good, there seemed to be no inclination to buy new books, and I felt very embarrassed. But then I had a new idea. It was the idea I'd wanted to write after that first novel and that had been niggling away for a couple of years. It drew on my experience in the House of Commons, in the law courts, as a student at Oxford, in exploring power, privilege and consent. It was, as my agent said, the book I was born to write. And that idea was Anatomy of a Scandal. Uh, we'll play the clip after. I'll just tell you a little bit more about it and then play the clip. Um, so Anatomy of a Scandal, if, if people haven't seen it, is about a charismatic government minister, Tory minister, who's accused of raping a parliamentary researcher with whom he's had an affair in a lift in the House of Commons. It drew on that experience with uh, Boris Johnson, uh, that, that sense that he could, he could lie and it didn't really matter and that there were different rules for him. I think we kind of now, with the lockdown parties are very well aware of it but in 2016 when I started writing this that still felt quite an audacious thing to be writing about. Um, it also drew on my experience at Oxford um, where boys in my year assumed actually quite rightly that they would get first and I would get two ones and where the very first person I met introduced me by by telling me his double barreled name by telling me his father was a diplomat that he'd been at Eton and where did I go to school. <laughs> And he also had the champagne in the fridge. Um, and it also drew on a sexual assault I'd experienced in my early 20s, although it was only, it's very weird the way these things work out. It was only by the time I got to the end of the first draft that I kind of think, oh, yeah, that's what I'm doing there. Um, I wrote it in a rush. I wasn't being paid for this. I didn't know if anybody would want it, so I couldn't waste much time writing something that I wasn't being paid for. And I managed to finish it in nine months. And it was only when it was over that I realised what I'd done because immediately, and this was the end of September 2016, the editors was really excited about it. It went to auction and it's now sold to 26 countries. It became pretty clear it was going to be what they call a big book. Then I got absolutely terrified. I would wake in the night thinking I was going to be arrested. Or <laughs> saying this. Um, and the reason it became a big book was because of events. As a writer, I'm uh, people will kindly say that I tap into sort of zeitgeisty issues, which I think is only because I was a journalist and so I'm constantly reading papers, listening to the news and picking up on, on ideas. Um, and this time I was writing about what we'd now call our Me Too experiences, but I had finished the book a whole year before the Harvey Weinstein allegations and the subsequent Pestminster um, allegations broke. And the whole introduction of Me Too as a new way of referencing um, sexual harassment and abuse. So the environment was actually perfect. The book became a Sunday Times bestseller. Uh, sorry, the book came out. So the book came out three months after all the Harvey Weinstein allegations. And so it was a really good, perfect storm for it. Became a Sunday Times bestseller, spent 10 weeks in the charts altogether. I went to Spain, Denmark and France to promote it and pretty quickly it was optioned um, for TV. I was really lucky, I had different teams of producers who wanted it and I had to have various different conference calls with different groups and I had great chemistry with the two women, Bruna Papandrea and Liza Chasen from two different production companies who banded together. Bruna had just made Big Little Lies with David E. Kelly and she was suggesting that who's married to Michelle Pfeiffer and she was suggesting that he write the screenplay and she kind of do another Big Little Lies. So that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I still wasn't sure if it was going to happen though. Only one in 12 books optioned actually get greenlit. That means, you know, actually happen, get filmed. And an option is a bit like paying a sort of little deposit on something. The team has got 18 months to... Um, try and work out if they've got a script and maybe if they've got an actress um, attached to it or a director and then try and get it commissioned by a streamer. 
this is this was all completely new to me I knew none of this and then in 2019 just over 18 months after it was optioned Netflix said they wanted it and I still wasn't allowed to say anything it still didn't really seem real at all because if you can't tell anybody and they haven't announced it you kind of know that they could pull the rug in front of out of from your feet and in fact they don't pay you until the day they start filming so it could absolutely be killed right up until that point it wasn't until I met the executive producer and director on March the 9th 2020 as the world was starting to shut down that I realized it was going to happen they mentioned that Sienna Miller was going to play the part of Sophie they wondered how I felt about Rupert Friend may have squealed at that point uh, filming was delayed because of Covid an author friend sent a gleeful message guess it's not going to happen now kind of took me straight back to those school days um, but the producers were committed they filmed um, from November 2020 to April 21 all through the toughest third lockdown they filmed in Oxford, Winchester, London Manchester and eventually I went on set in Shepparton where they filmed a lot of it as well and I went to the premiere just after seeing the video of it playing at Piccadilly Circus and knowing the same thing was being played um, in Times Square which was pretty surreal again it couldn't have been more timely because the premiere was the day after uh, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak were fined for party gate. <laughs> it was like entitlement. Um, it was even more key. We could see the. Can we see the clip now? Is that okay? It meant nothing. It was just sex. Nothing's just sex. There's more. You're not telling me just to tell me to unburden yourself. The story's about to break. Sometimes I think I'm partly to blame. I let things slide. Making this right is all I care about. Didn't question little things when I should have. Won't your wife be wondering where you are? She trusts me. But little things add up. Look at me. I'd like to ask you a few questions. There's been an accusation. This case should never have been brought. It's the things I'm for. I said the accused barrister. I think you should publicly distance yourself from White House. Why? Because the behavior of entitled toffs is something the public no longer finds cute. I know my husband. He's a good man. He's a man. I feel very confused. Me. About everything. James Whitehouse's privilege does not extend to rape. The word rape and my name have nothing to do with each other! I have no further questions for this witness. I didn't do what I'm accused of. If I don't get some order in my thoughts, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Cheetah, cheetah! All of your stories keep changing. For whatever reason, somebody is lying. Am I looking at him? So it became a, um, you can see, hopefully you can see from that if you haven't watched it, that, you know, the Oxford, it's the Bullingdon Club, which I call the Libertines, which becomes the backstory there. And obviously my experience covering court cases enabled me to write the, the court scenes. I actually followed a barrister in a rape trial to write it and she was really, really good and kind of um, gave feedback on the novel to make sure I got all that right. Um, anyway, it became a global number one Netflix show. It was watched by 48 million for 48 million hours in the first three days and 75 million in the week after. It didn't mean that the book rocketed up the charts, something I'd secretly hoped for, but more importantly, it, it did touch women worldwide. And I feel... I felt incredibly passionate about this story um, and the fact that it was made into a show is the single thing I'm most proud of in my career. I think uh, there's a scene in which Kate, which is in the book, in which Kate delineates the legal definition of rape. And I, I just think that's incredible that a global show 
goes into that such detail and there was a real disconnect I was saying there's a real disconnect between some slightly snotty broadsheet reviews from entitled white men who didn't engage at all with the issue of entitlement or consent and the comments that I was reading on Twitter or the messages I was receiving from other women who were saying things like you've completely reflected my experience or you know women on Twitter who were just saying this is our experience and you know the new generation need to learn about that meanwhile i wrote two other novels uh, little disasters which is about um it's not there uh, which is about motherhood and madness um adhering to nor efron's everything in co is copy idea i, I kind of drew on on the maternal ocd that i'd experienced it became Waterstones Thrill of the Month, but unfortunately it was published in the first and third lockdown. So I think we have to kind of discount. It's really unfortunate having a book coming out 10 days after the first lockdown when no bookshops are open and Amazon's not delivering and Sainsbury's hasn't got any books on the shelves. And again, having Waterstones Thrill of the Month in a month when Waterstones is closed is not a very good idea either. Um, and then I've just written a book called Reputation which is about a female MP this time who is accused of murdering a tabloid journalist with whom she's become entangled when he's found dead in her home. But it's really about... It was, it was inspired by an interview I read with um, Jess Phillips, uh, but I also researched it by talking to other female MPs like Heidi Allen, who was then our MP, Luciana Berger, Anna Subri, and it's about the difficulty of navigating your way in public life in a world where there's internet stalking and trolling. Um, and also there's a sort of subplot for, for a teenage girl who's being bullied on social media too. Um, both these books have been optioned. Um, uh, Reputation has been optioned by the same team as Anatomy of a Scandal. And with both of them, I'm an executive producer, which means I give notes on scripts, uh, which is which is great. It's, I, I think it can be a sort of a vanity title, you know, just another sort of credit up there. But I've really enjoyed the collaborative nature of it and the fact that they've listened to what I've said on various different versions of the scripts, and I feel like I'm kind of learning a new skill as well. And now I'm supposed to finish another novel by New Year, which is looking a little bit ambitious, <laughs> um, but it'll have to be done. Um, and I'm wondering if I could start writing scripts because I think we all need to be adaptable. The pandemic's had an impact on people's reading habits, um, but I write, seem to write stories that translate well for the screen. And I think the world needs stories, whether they're factual ones from journalists speaking truth to power or fictional ones, sometimes exploring the same themes. And perhaps we need these, this storytelling and this fact finding and this holding to account more than ever these days. Um, when I went to university, the, the film Dead Poets Society had just come out and the rather charismatic JCR president told us freshers to carpe diem. I didn't actually know what that meant. <laughs> it means to seize the day. And he meant it to, to, to take every opportunity going to seize it to grasp it to squeeze the pips of your experience dry um i think i've done that by moving from news journalism to fiction i've le i learned to have an ear for a story and that's no different really whether you're writing a hundred thousand word thriller or a 600 word lead when i trained as a journalist we were told what would you what would you tell your friend down the pub you know what's the what's the top line and actually when you pitch a a book like I've just said you know it's about a government minister is accused of rape or you know that's exactly what you're doing whether it's a, a news story a, or, or a thriller um, and I think I had a great apprenticeship for writing novels and that I had the discipline of writing pop copy that hopefully caught the reader's attention and retained it and I try to do that writing every day I suspect that going forwards Hill students um, you know Gen Z the COVID kids whose GCSEs were disrupted and they've lived through a global pandemic and shown such resilience and doing so are going to be much more capable of being malleable uh, like that and they're going to grab these opportunities too. I think I've been lucky but I've also worked really hard. As the American novelist uh, Richard Bark said, a professional writer is an amateur who didn't quit. I think you do need a certain ability with words, a talent for seeing a story but I do think that's something you can develop and I'm absolutely convinced that if I can do this you can too. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please subscribe to be notified when our next episode is available and consider joining us at the college for one of our live events.